Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Good morning. Good to see everybody here at our main campus. Welcome to you guys that are joining us online. So a couple things before we get started. So you might miss this, but I want to make sure that you don't. Uh, all the work that goes into getting ready for the Christmas season. So I want to kind of give you the, the backstory. So the, the idea is this is what we know. So in this season, right or wrong, whatever it produces, is opportunities to reach people for Jesus that you don't normally have during the, the, the regular year, right? This month, there are going to be people, because this is what we know, for a lot of us, uh, the Christmas season brings great joy, and for a lot of us, the Christmas season brings a lot of angst, a lot of anxiety, a lot of who's missing, who's not there, family, you know, things that you've ignored inside of your family, and then you have them over, right? And then do you remember all why you've ignored those things in your family or those people in your family? So there's just both and that goes with it. But inside of that, the opportunity to share the gospel during Christmas and during Easter, for whatever reason, people are more open for that. So when we prepare, we don't just prepare because we want the stage to look good. As you see, the stage design changed. A lot of work went into that all week long. Uh, stage design team in here working to get that ready. Decorations in uh, here and out in the cafe and in the hallway. Reason B, right, is when you bring your guest that's searching for Jesus, that they will feel welcome and they will hear the word and that they will see the environment and that God will invade their life. Right, that, that's the idea behind it. So we just wanna make sure that we recognize that we don't just do things to do things, right? Like we're not just putting in the work to get ready uh, so that, that the church looks better or the, the, the worship center looks better. We're doing it because we're trusting God for opportunities uh, to reach people that we don't normally get uh, and hope that you'll pray through that too. Now, Here's the other thing. If you've come to Life Church for a while, we always do a Christmas series, and I always get to share my love-hate relationship with Christmas. So the people that have been coming, you know, for a long time have always heard, like, uh, the, I won't say the hate that I have for Christmas, the, the weirdness that goes with it, right? Like, this is what I say about, about Christmas is, is that, it's, that it's odd, number one, and again, don't take this the wrong way, but... You know, around Christmas, we all decide that we should give coats away and we should give food away and we could give shoes away and we give money away, but the rest of the year we forget about it, right? So I'm like, I get it why we do it, but it probably be, should be something we do all the time, right? Like we sh probably shouldn't just have a, a giving tree once a year, like we should be giving all the time, you know, or we intentionally go out and, and we, we talk to people that we wouldn't normally talk to. We, we're in relationships with people. We should probably do that all the time. And this is the other crazy thing, and this might not be you, right? Like this might just be a few people, but it's crazy how the stress of getting ready for Christmas takes away the meaning of Christmas. You know, I don't know, you know, the, whether that is you or not you, but you know, you gotta get ready for your family get together. You gotta buy presents that nobody needs, right? Like, you ever notice that? Like, you buy a lot of presents, and the whole thing is you're struggling and you need a list. You know why you need a list? Because no one needs anything. <laughs> Nobody's excited about that part, right? <laughs> like, I'm just saying, it's Christmas all year, kids. What do you need, right? Like, you're getting stuff all the time, but anyway, that's the. The, the kind of weird side of it. But I do love um, the opportunities, the conversations, and the things that get to happen um, around this season that give us the chance to reflect, right? That's part of what the Christmas season does. I don't know if any of you guys, like, you're, you're putting up your Christmas tree, you're, you're getting ready for, for get-togethers, you're, you're planning out everything, and then you have this moment where you reflect back on your childhood, when you used to like it. You know, when you didn't have to put up a Christmas tree, you just let everybody else do the work and you got to enjoy all of it, you know, that part of it. You reflect back on moments. I'm, I'm guessing that most people in this room have memories to be able to share, right? Like I want to, like back to my childhood, like remember this thing around Christmas and then maybe you're trying to recreate it again uh, in what you're doing. It gives you a time to not only reminisce and reflect, it gives you an opportunity uh, to be in relationships maybe with some people that you haven't been in a long time. So this series, right, is to prepare us or for us to think about this whole idea that this is the reason for the season. 
Jesus being born into this earth is not only good news, it is great news, right? And that that news, here's what you need to know. Like, you might know this personally. That news, because of what it's done for your life, should have transformed you forever, that gift, right? The gift of Jesus Christ should have transformed everything about you and every ways that you do anything uh, in your life because of the gift of Jesus Christ. Like, that should be transformational inside of you. And so we're going to talk about why is it good news and, and what is it that should be changing uh, in our life. And the other thing that we're going to talk about that is, um, like today we're going to talk about the gift, you know, that the, the king, you know, came and he brought gifts. And then we're going to look at people's lives that received the gift of Christ and what it looked at in their lives and how they responded to it and how we can respond in the same way. So today we're going to focus on this idea that, you know, when, when Jesus came, he brought bearing gifts that changed the world, right? The gifts that he gave because of his birth changed the world. So for me, I thought about what were those gifts that you got? You, you get, ever get one of those when you were a kid that changed everything? Right? Like, you, you remember? It was like that one thing. I'll just give you what it was for me. So we went through the process. I don't know how your, you know, Christmas thing worked, but um, the night before, we had to get ready for Santa Claus, and Santa Claus loved cookies and Pepsi, you know, and so we would, <laughs> we would get it all lined up. You know, you put the cookies out, you, you, you know, you put the bottle of Pepsi out, and, you know, Santa in our house didn't like milk, right? You know, so... <laughs> You get all of those things out, and you get them ready, and then you wake up the next morning, and it, the tradition was in our family, like, you come down, and the gifts are all there, you know, and ready to go, and you're super excited about opening them up, and then there was always that one gift. You ever have that, like, that one gift that was, like, hidden somewhere, and you open them all up, and then your mom and dad are like, I have one more, right? I have one more gift, and, and some of those gifts were like, really, you saved that for last? <laughs> And some of those gifts were like life-changing, right? Like things that in our household changed everything. And so for me, one of those gifts was we got done, we opened up all of our gifts, and uh, they said, we're going to take you out to the garage, we're going to give you this gift. And I walk out there, inside of our garage was this 90 three-wheeler, right? Come on, old people. Remember the three-wheelers? All the, all the young people are like, three-wheelers. Like, nobody has three-wheelers. It was a 90 with these great big balloon tires on the back of it. The thing looked weird as crap. I mean, it would sit like that. But for us, it was transformational because, again, we didn't have anything to go out into the snow. We didn't have any opportunities to go out and do anything. And I mean, for all of Christmas Day and then for a really long time until we completely destroyed the three-wheeler, right? And we were out there all of the time, outside, it changed something, right? Like something, a gift that was given that, that you could then use that changed what you could be able to do. Or I remember, so one of the traditions at our house was is you would do Christmas and then all of the cousins would come over. And so we had cousins from South Adams and we're from Adams Central and they had two boys and then it was me and Stanley and You'd always have a football game, right? And, and back then, everybody liked the Cowboys and the Steelers. You know, like way back then, that was like everybody's team. So we'd go out and we'd play tackle football, right? And so it was always about who was going to be able to win, and it always turned it with somebody getting hurt, bloodied up, you know, like some, something happened during the tackle football game. So one year, for Christmas, we all got either Steelers jerseys, pads, and helmets, or Cowboys jerseys, pads, and helmets, and a football game transformed, right? <laughs> I mean, now it is on, right? Like, you don't have to hold back. You don't have to worry about, I mean, nobody even talked about concussions. We would just say, like, you saw stars three or four times during the game, (laughs) you know, because you never talked about, like, somebody got a concussion. You're just like, you got your bell rung, and it's okay. You'll be good. Shake your head a little bit, get the dizziness out, and you'll be good and move on, right? But that was the, the idea, right? The idea was gifts that change the things that you do. So here's what I want to process. What makes a good gift? But have you ever thought about that? Like, what is it that, that if, I, if I would take this gift, right? Jennifer, wrap this up for us today. So if you would take this gift and you would go up to somebody and you were getting ready to give it, right? And you wanted, you wanted to be able to give this gift to somebody, what would make it good, right? Like, if you would ask the person, right, what makes this gift good? Well, a lot of people are like, well, it depends on what's in it. 
True? Right? Like a lot of people are going to be like, what's in it? You know, is it, is it something, you know, that, that, that I would love or is it something, you know, because if you ever got the gifts for you, like you open up, you're like, wow. It's avocado. Thank you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you, you don't want to be, or, you know, when you were, your kids were little, you always worried what they would say. Did anybody have that? Like grandma brought gifts over and they're ready to open them and they open them up and you're, you know what your kid's going to say. This sucks. <laughs> right? Like you're worried that that's going to go through their mind because you already know what they're thinking because you knew when they opened it up they were going to think that idea. So what makes the gift good? And, and here's, here's what we know. From a, from a giver standpoint, it's like, so think of it from, from this standpoint. I get it. Like, some people can't stop buying gifts. You know, I always say, why, why do you keep buying gifts, right? Like, and here's the reason. Like, what makes a good gift is a giver that wants to give it, right? Like, part of what makes a good gift is this idea that regardless of what's in there, it does something in the heart of the person that's giving. You know what I mean? Like, they, they want to be able to give it. And here's what's so cool. For the people that are truly that way, they want to give gifts and they don't expect anything in return. You know what I mean? That makes the best gift giving, right? The idea that if you got a gift and you want to give a gift, you can give it without any expectation of getting anything in return, right? Like that makes that gift good, right? Here's the other thing that makes a gift good. Do you need it, right? Like think about this for a second. Anybody ever have the grandma that just keeps buying you underwear and socks? Like, you just keep piling them up, and they're the whitey tidies. You ain't wearing them anyway. <laughs> Anybody remember those days? Well, there ain't nobody wearing that underwear, Grandma. Like, I don't know. Every year, they just keep piling it up. You keep putting it off to the side. You keep saying thank you because your mom warned you, right? Don't you ever say, I don't need no more underwear, white T-shirts, or white socks that I never wear, right? Like, I had that Grandma. Like, Grandma brought me that stuff, and I'm thinking, this is crazy, right? But... And the concept would be is, is that what makes it good is, is it's something that we need, right? Like it's something that when we get it and, and, and when we use it, it was like, oh man, that meets a need. That's why when somebody who's giving a gift puts it out there and they says this, they, they say, give me a list, right? And, and when you're looking through the list, you know, somebody giving the gift or somebody receiving, what do I need? What do I want, right? And you put, put those things together. Here's the other thing that you receive the gift, right? This is what makes a gift good. You'll receive this gift without any idea or any guilt that you have to give something back, right? Like, have you ever had um, married couples? You ever had, don't buy me anything? Anybody ever have that? Don't fall into that trap, guys. They're lying. <laughs> They're lying. It's not true. It's not true. When they say, don't buy me anything, it's like subliminal language. That's what women do. It's subliminal language for buy me a great gift, right? But the idea is, is when you can get something and you cannot feel guilty and feel like you need to give something back, right? It makes the gift good when you can receive it. You know, part of the problem in our world today is we're not good gift receivers. Like somebody wants to give you something and you're like, oh no, I don't deserve it. And what do you want back? And what's the exchange? Because we live in this world where you can't just accept, you know what? I love you. I have a gift for you. I had no expectation of you giving it back. Like what needs to transform inside of your heart is this idea. Be a good gift receiver, right? Just, you know what you can do? You could just say thank you. You don't have to come up with the, the, you know, I don't deserve it. And you don't have to come up with the, you know, I'll get, I'll get you something back because that's what happens, you know, when your wife tricked you, you know, and you're sitting there on a Sunday morning and there's no gifts for her under it. And then all of a sudden she comes out of the closet with your gift and you're sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, I, I love you, honey. I'll get you something. I promise. Right. And just instead of just saying, you were the liar. Thank you for the gift. You know, I'll take it. I'll take it. You're the one who lied. I'll take the gifts. Thank you. Thank you, right? But that makes it good, right, when you, when you can be a good gift receiver, right? The other thing is, is that we know what makes a gift good is when it changes something, right? When you open that gift, something changes. You're going to take that. And again, it doesn't matter. You can make it as small as 
you know what? I'm, I, I work outside. I'm freezing to death. I need a new pair of coveralls. So now I'm going out, and when I'm working, I'm not freezing to death. It changed something, right? Sometimes I think we get too elaborate on the things that we think that we need to do and the things that we think we need to buy. Like, it doesn't need to be that elaborate. It's just that when I open this and when I use it, I am going, it's something in my life is going to change. Now, here, here's the key to good gifts and to gift giving, okay? And this is going to make sense, I hope. When you get in this idea that you're getting gifts and you're receiving gifts and gifts are changing your life and, and you get the whole idea behind it all, right, that it doesn't just turn into, you know, what the bad side of gift giving, which is we just buy a bunch of stuff just so people can open stuff that don't change anything with a bunch of unthankful kids that are a bunch of brats. Right, like that side of it. But the good side of it, if we go through what makes these gifts good, you know what's gonna, you know what's gonna make it even better? Right? What's going to make it even better is when you learn that when you get gifts that transform things, you know what's going to happen? When you get gifts that transform things, you know what you're going to do? You're going to give that gift away. And you're going to keep giving, and you're going to keep giving, and you're going to keep giving because something inside of you changed, right? Don't feel like you need to hold it the whole time. You can just put it on the ground. <laughs> but you know, no, you can just keep it. I'll get it back after the service. But you see what I'm saying? Like this idea that once you have got gifts that change your life, something changes inside of you. Like this, I want to be a gift giver because I see the joy. I see the happiness. I see the transformation. I want to be able to give those things. So we're going to focus on that today. So here's the deal. We're going to look at, so if you have a Bible, you can turn to Luke 2, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 21, the Christmas story. And inside of this, this is what we want to focus on. When Jesus Christ came to the earth, he came bearing gifts, right? And these gifts that he brought, just like we talked about, you know, the idea of, of what good gift giving is and what these gifts should look like, the idea that when Jesus came, the same concept was in place. Right? When he came bearing gifts, those gifts were supposed to change something, right? And they were supposed to be. Here, here's the thing. If, if you don't know this, we got to be reminded of this. These were good gifts that would transform everything. They weren't just, you know, we we're talking about the gift giving that doesn't work. This is the gift giving that should work. Right, this is the gift giving that should change things. So when we look at this, we're gonna look at the three gifts, right, that he brought with him and how it should transform your life. Are you ready? All right, Luke 2, starting in verse 1. In those days, in Caesarea, uh, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken in the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Curius was the governor of, Cy uh, of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up to the town of Nazareth in Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, to the town of David, because he belonged to the house uh, of the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with an angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and going into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard were amazed at the shepherds and said to them, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all things that they had heard and seen, 
which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time for, circum for the, to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. So here's what you're going to see in the Christmas story. Something that maybe, I don't know if you have this tradition, you know, uh, anybody guys still have like the big Bible that you read the Christmas story out of? Nobody has Bibles anymore. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anybody read the Christmas story? Like you read the Christmas story? Yeah, part of your tradition is you get together, you read this Christmas story. Well, the thing that I want to pull out of this is here's the idea. When you read the Christmas story, here's the thing that you're going to see. Gifts given that transform the lives of the people, right? The gift that was given, Christ being born, not only was a great announcement, not only was it an incredible message and good news, it was going to be good news that will bring great joy, that will transform all things. So we're gonna look at three gifts. One of the gifts that we're gonna look at is a transformation of who we are, and then in a transformation of who we are, it should change two emotions, right, in your life. Like it should transform two foundational emotions in our life. That This is what I believe. If we could get these two things right in our life, like if we could understand these two emotions that we struggle with continually in all of our life, it would transform everything, right? So here's the first gift. If you look at it, go back to verse 14. It says, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those whom his favor rests. You know what the first gift was? The first gift was righteousness. Jesus Christ was bringing an opportunity for you to be right with God. You know, like, well, that was kind of boring. <laughs> like, what's the, what's the big deal? I want you to think about this for a second. Like, you know the whole, uh, what makes a good gift? You know, we talked about that in the beginning, what makes a good gift? Think about this. God was going to send his son, knowing what was gonna happen, right? Like, he was going to send just think about this. Jesus Christ is in heaven and things are going pretty well, right? It's not like he was up there. I'm kind of getting restless and I'd love to go to earth where people hate me and will kill me and beat me beyond human recognition. What do you think, Father? You want me to jump down in there? Like there wasn't this restlessness that was happening in heaven. There was this, this thing, God saying, you know what? We need to change things. And I'm gonna freely give a gift, freely, with no expectation of a return. Isn't that cool? It's like, he's giving you the gift of salvation without an expectation of anything after that, right? The thing that we get messed up when it comes to righteousness and the thing that we get messed up when it comes to salvation, you know what he's expecting from you? To believe in Jesus Christ and his blood who will cover you so that you can stand in front of God someday and be welcomed into the kingdom. He's giving it to you. Think about this. Would you give a gift to somebody that's mean to you? Would you give a gift to somebody who ignores you? Right, like we tend to give gifts to the people that we like, at least most of the time. Right? We tend to give to the people th that we like. We tend to give to the people that we're in relationship. Here's God giving a gift to his people who have been spitting on him. A gift to his people who have abandoned him. A gift to his people that have walked away from him. But he said, even though you walk away, I'm walking forward. Like, I think that's pretty cool. Like, if you think of that idea, and do you need it? You know, part of the problem with salvation today is, is that we get this false sense of security, like we have this false salvation. I've said this all the time. Part of the problem with American Christianity, a lot of people think that they are saved and they're really not. Like, I think that's a huge problem, right? And it starts with you miss the idea of why you need to be saved to begin with, right? Like somehow you're doing it for, again, not to accept, not to get a gift from, from, a, from a God who wants to transform something, because you know what makes a gift good? Is it changes something. You see, part of the problem today is salvation has changed nothing for you. Yes, no, maybe. I'm not saying you don't have to nod, because then you're thinking I'm going to be thinking of you, right? But... But the idea is we live in a world where salvation, the gift that you've been given, 
is more about fire insurance than it is about a changed life. Here's the gift. When you want to cash it in someday, right, it's like you get a little certificate that once you get to the end of your life, you get to cash in and say, I'm in because I got. That, that's just not the way it works. Righteousness means this. Not one person in this room was born in right standing with God and should fear hell until they receive the gift of salvation, period. That's just the way that it works. You're not born into it. Whether you grow up in a Christian home or not, this is a lot of people's story. Well, I grew up in a Christian home and I'm just faithful because I grew up in a Christian home. No, you are saved because you made a decision that you weren't right and you need to get right. You see, and part of our problem is today is, is that this, this gift, this idea of salvation, this being right with God is missing in a lot of people's lives. And so these two other gifts that he gives us in emotion is always fleeting because this part isn't right, right? So the thing that we got to get right today is this. If you're not right with God, you need to get right. If you haven't understood that, that without the gift of Jesus Christ and his blood that you will be changed forever, you should probably change that today. You shouldn't wait. You shouldn't, you shouldn't uh, hope that someday that it happens because here's what you have to do, right? What makes, what makes a good gift? Right? You need it, right? The other thing you gotta do is you gotta receive it. And what's it mean, right? Like, what, what's it mean? Just put it back to the idea of, you know, what changed, simple, right? What changed when I got the three-wheeler? It's not like, oh, God, I, don't, I don't really want it. You know, it's like, oh, no, I want it. I'm gonna ride it. It's gonna change things. I'm gonna do things that I was never able to do before. Anybody tracking? We're gonna be able to pull sleds. We're gonna be able to go out. We're gonna be able to do. When you're saved and you receive the gift of salvation, you are different and should be doing things that are different that you could never do before. That's the way that it works. And kind of a litmus test, I'll give you a litmus test, you know, this idea of, you know, like, I don't know, am I right, am I not right? Anybody that's received a gift that has transformed their life will give and give and give and give and give and give and it's Christmas all year long. If you don't care about people who are lost, then you've never got a gift that has changed your life. I've never understood being a part of, and I will never understand, a Christian church and Christian peoples and gatherings of people that don't, on a semi-regular basis, think about those people who are lost. Because when you get a gift that transforms things, you're gonna do something about it. It changed you, and you know what you're gonna do? You're gonna keep giving that. I wanna give that gift. I wanna give that gift. I wanna give that gift because that gift changed me. I wanna give it to somebody else. I wanna care. I wanna move on. I wanna tell. I wanna bring. I wanna invite. I wanna do like your whole life is motivated around, man, this changed me, and I wanna give it to you. That's the idea. And when that gift is right and we're in, we're in right standing with God, that not only is a good gift, that gift transforms everything, right? So the first gift, the thing that he says is that one, to whom his favor rests, you know why God's favor rests upon you? Not based upon anything that you did, but based upon Jesus Christ coming to this earth, dying for you on a cross so that you now can stand in front of God saved. That's why his favor rests on you. Not because you're good, ain't none of you good. Join the club, right? Ain't none of us good. We're just all right, right? In right standing, in the right place because of what he did. That's the first gift. Now, that gift, you know, and he says, I'll just read 2 Corinthians 5, 21, or 5, uh, starting in verse 17. Let me just read this to you quick. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. That's the whole idea. You get the gift and something's different. You're a new creation, and it has come. The old has gone. The new is here, right? This, this new person is here. All this is from God who reconciled uh, to us himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, the gift of Jesus, bringing things back together. 
And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore, right, because of that, Christ's ambassadors. That's the whole idea. If you get a gift, what should you do? Give a gift, right? That's the whole ambassador, like, because of reconciliation, because you've been reconciled before God, you should turn around and help other people get reconciled. That's what he tells us. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, and though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled with God. Here's the key verse. God made him who had no sin be sin for us so that, why? Why did Jesus live a sinful life? Why did he die on a cross? So that we might become righteous in front of God. If you haven't done that, don't leave today without doing that. I'll give you a chance at the end. Don't walk away out of this room without an opportunity to get that right because the next gift is this, right? The idea that if his favor rests, right, that the gift of Jesus Christ brings great peace. Now, all of you guys that are like, <laughs> Peace, know what it's like to live in an anxious world. Anybody, you don't have to have anxiety to once in a while be stressed out. Anybody stressed out once in a while? Some of us more than others. Some of us, you know, have those, those moments that are stressful more than others. He says, listen to me. Now, this isn't, when we look at this, this isn't a condemnation, right? Like the condemnation, if you're anxious and you're stressful, like all of those things, it's a, it's a revealing, right? Because here's what he says. If you accept the gift of salvation, he will give you a peace to fight against anxiety. Does that make sense? Not that you'll never be anxious. Not that you'll ever be, not be stressed. Don't you wish you had that pill? There ain't no pill that does that, right? The idea is he gives you this, this being right with God gives you the ability in the midst of, right? In the midst of a stressful world, in the midst of a diagnosis, in the midst of your kids being crazy, in the midst of your husband being crazy, in the midst of whatever's going on in your life, you know how you can face it? You know how we can face that idea? The peace that will fight against the anxiety that Satan's trying to bring in, right? Because for all of us, this is what we know. Stress and, and anxiety, these are things that, that when, when brought in, right, into our life, they just change things, right? They make life difficult. Because think about this. You ever, um, you ever get something, like you get sick, you get a cough, you get a bump, and you go on WebMD, Anybody ever been on web, Ebony? Anybody start down that rabbit hole, right? Like, I got this little bump, and then you type in little bump on my arm, under my arm, and they're like, you're dying. <laughs> right? Doesn't that seem to be like the, the, the way those things go? Like, it, it causes this sense of anxiety and this sense of angst because you, 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 you think, this is what we think. We think knowledge brings peace we think knowledge takes away anxiety, and neither one of those things do. Think about it. Just because you know your diagnosis doesn't make you have peace. Listen, you can run the numbers all day long, and you can try to run your business to the best of your ability, and you can put all of the things in place. You can get all of the knowledge you want to work the market, do the market, put things in place, but at the end of the day, does that bring peace? Because guess what happens sometimes? It doesn't work. Anybody ran the numbers that didn't turn out the way they were supposed to? Right? On paper, man, you were going to be a millionaire. In real life, it sucked. Right? Those numbers, they didn't calculate. They didn't work. Because what happened is, is somehow we think knowledge brings control. You know why you're anxious? Because you know what you figured out? You're not in control. That's the problem. I mean, the reason that we're anxious is because we've tried to control things that are absolutely not controllable. 
Anybody ever do that? Like, I'm raising my hand. I've done that. Like, I think somehow if I do this and I do this and I put this contract together and I, you know what? At the end of the day, I'm not in control of any of those things. I can do the best I can, right? I can do the best I can, but at the end of the day, I'm not in control. Now, coming from somebody who loves control, anybody else like to be in control? Yeah, I mean, come on. I mean, we want to be able to wrap up in a bow our life, and we want it to go like we want it to go, and we think, and we get mad at God when it doesn't go the way we want it to go. Anybody? I did, and I put out, and I've done, and, and we did, and we worked hard, and then all of a sudden, you're like, man, <laughs> this doesn't work, and then you try to, you, you, you got a choice at this point. You can keep getting anxious, you can keep getting stressed out, or you can just give up control. Anybody? Now, you can understand, because remember, this goes in order. You know why you can give up control? Because you're right with God. True? But the reason that you can give it, um, you ever in a relationship with somebody, you just want to, like, Nobody's ever had that, like those people that you just want to. Yeah, I mean, come on, like you just, maybe it's just me. I, I get these times where these people say some things and I just want to wring their neck. Right, like I'm thinking, if I find you, see you, if I could just get close to you. Like, these are just the emotions that go through. But you know what finally gives me the peace? Because I know that's probably going to put me in jail, right? So, like, <laughs> the things that, that give me peace, right, is here's what I can trust. Because I am right with God, you know what he says? Vengeance isn't mine, it's his. So I can just trust. I don't have to fix the situation. I don't actually have to fix that idiot, Right? I don't have to do anything about it because God's work in that person's life is going to do far greater things than anything that I could ever do. True? Right? We can get it because listen to what Paul says. This is uh, Philippians 4. You guys have heard this scripture before. Philippians 4. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Peace of God, what is it? We just talked about it. So what is the peace of God? The peace of God is knowing that we are right with God. That's the peace. Like the peace of God is to know that we are on the right side. Of, you're on the right team, right? You're going down the right road, right? That's the peace that surpasses all understanding because when, when things happen in our life, we're thinking, how, how do I become peaceful? Because you're on the right team. That's how you can become peaceful. And he says, this is really important, don't miss this. Peace that surpasses all understanding that's supposed to guard two things. What's it supposed to guard? Heart and your mind. Why is that so important? Because you know what he knows? Think about this. You know what he knows? Satan can no longer steal your soul, but he can steal your life by taking your mind. You know what happens when your mind gets wrapped up in anxiety and stress and things? You know what happens to that week? <laughs> right? Anybody had that week? You know where you're stressed out, worried about, trying to put together, and you get to the end of the week, and you thought you did, and you worked hard, and then you get to the end of the week, and you're like, oh, that was terrible. Right? I did everything I could, but it was terrible. Right? Because Satan knows if I can steal even one day of your life, not even one week. If I can steal one day, it's a victory because it's one day that you're not focused on the thing that matters most. If I can get to your heart, if I can get to your mind, that's what Satan's doing. So when we're thinking about the fight, you got to remember your enemy. If you want the peace, it's not the peace that everything turns out the way that you want. The peace is winning against an enemy that's trying to steal your life. Don't let him win. Don't let them win. Because you're right with God, because you're on the right team, because then now the emotion that you can go back to every single time is I'm going to have a peace that surpasses all understanding. And when I have that peace, Satan, you're not getting into here and you're not getting into here. Right? You know what the next thing that brings? You know what the next gift is? Right? Joy. <laughs> now, 
remember this, this whole idea is, you know, when we talk about joy, because he says, if you're right with God, you're not only going to have peace, you're going to have joy. You know what joy is scripturally? This idea that regardless of any circumstance in life, right, because we tend to live happy based upon circumstances. Anybody? Circumstances in the week were good, pretty happy. Circumstances in the week that were bad, pretty sad, right? Joy is being in the right place with a sense of regardless of what happens to you this week. Because have you ever seen people like this? It's not about these people are, because uh, I think this is a fallacy. Like people are just joyful and bubbly all the time, you know? Well, part of that's just fake, right? Like part of that is like nobody's just all the time that way. Sometimes, and maybe some people are, but I would say most of the time we're just good at putting on masks. Right, like you're just gonna put up a front. Somebody's like, you're gonna be mad, and somebody walks in. You're like, <laughs> so good to see you, right? Or you're gonna you're gonna be bubbly, but inside you're not, right? Like you're gonna try to get through. What I'm talking about when it comes to joy, you ever around somebody that like, you look at the circumstances and you'll be like, they should be mad. They should be upset. They they right, should be angry. They should be, like, you look at them, you're like, how can they keep going? Have you ever seen anybody like that? Like, a bunch of bad circumstances happen, and you look at them, and you're like, how do they keep going? How do they keep doing? How do they keep pressing forward? Not how do they keep smiling, right? That's not what I'm saying. It's not how they keep smiling. You know, it's not why are they happy all the time. It's how do they keep moving forward, even in the midst of the circumstances that are happening in their life? See, joy isn't about whether you have a smile or not. Joy is whether you're going to keep moving forward regardless of the circumstances in life. Joy is gonna give you the ability to be able to move forward in your life regardless of what your husband says, regardless of what your wife says, regardless of how your money turns out, regardless of the things around you, you're going to keep moving forward. You know why? Because you're right with God and you have a peace that surpasses all understanding and you know your purpose on this earth and the purpose on this earth wasn't to be happy all the time. The purpose on this earth was to serve a God who gave you a gift and you're gonna give it back regardless of the circumstances in life. Nobody's gonna keep me down, right? Nobody's going to keep me because the idea is if we live, this is what we know, if we live, listen to this, Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God. So when Jesus came down, he set up this, this idea that he wants to bring thy kingdom come. You remember that prayer? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Like pray. He wanted to establish his kingdom on this earth, Right? So this goes with this idea. So what does his kingdom look like? Well, his kingdom started with this whole idea of a gift, right? The kingdom started with this idea. Now you can be right with God through Jesus Christ. Now you can have a peace that surpasses all understanding. Now circumstances of life aren't going to affect your mission in life. That's the kingdom, right? When he established the kingdom, that's how it's gonna move forward because in Romans 17, he says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of, of eating and drinking. You know what he's talking about? The kingdom of God is not about your external circumstances. That's what he's trying to say. The kingdom of God, like so many times, we wrap up whether things are good and whether things are working on external things that don't matter. Right? It's not about external things. It's not about eat, drink, be merry, get everything you want while you're here, you have every experience while you want while you're here. Here's what he says. But righteousness, right standing, the thing that we talked about, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what he says. God's kingdom on this earth will happen because you're right with him, because you have a peace that surpasses all understanding, and that we can live joyful, regardless of the circumstances of life. So the worship team's gonna come back up. I wanna finish with this. Think about this for a second. So if we're processing this, this whole idea, like, because I honestly think this one's hard. Like I think, you know, getting right with God, obviously don't leave today. If you're not right with God, we wanna pray with you, help you, whatever that takes, you know. Peace that surpasses all understanding, like when we work through this idea of, of what we need to do. But there are times in my life that the circumstances build up. Anybody? Like you wanna be joyful? 
You want to be faithful, but it's like one thing after another. Right, like I was faithful, and then you get that message, and you're like, it's not how it's supposed to work, is it? I was joyful when it sucked here. Does it have to suck again? Anyone? And not only does it have to not suck again and again and again, like is there anything, is there any, anybody, any light at the end of the tunnel? Got anybody else to pick on? Nobody ever thought about that, right? You got somebody else. <laughs> somebody else surely needs some of this. I'll, like, I'll gladly pass it on. I'm not saying this as a whiner. I'm just saying sometimes these things add up, right? And I'm sitting there thinking, you need to be joyful. You know what's helped me? I'll just give you something personally helpful. You. I started, and again, you can call it whatever you want, is before I approach the day, one of the things that, that I do now uh, in my journaling is I write down the things that I'm thankful for because in the midst, you know what Satan ends up doing to me? Like there's a lot of things that suck, but there are a lot of things that are good. You know? And Satan tends to get us focused on the things that suck and we miss the things that God is doing. Right? We can't miss the things that God's doing. Right? I, I can't, because this has happened to me. Like I get so focused on these things that aren't going right. And then I look up and I'm like, holy cow, God is good. God is amazing. God is doing great things. Like these circumstances still aren't any better. But that and that and this and that, like, man, why am I so blessed? Anyone? God, why did you choose me? Why do you use me? Why do you give me another chance? Right, and when you write those things down every single day, it allows you to take good news that will bring great joy. Now, here's my challenge for you. Next steps, right? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to evaluate, first of all. Anybody in this room, I want you to evaluate. If you're not right with God, please don't leave today without getting right with God. Don't go into this Christmas season. Don't go into this, go, don't take another day, right, without that. You want prayed for, we have people, and I know this isn't planned, but we have people that will pray with you, pray for you. We got people that are here from the prayer team. Like, come forward, go to the back, find somebody. Don't wait, get right. Right? You need that in your life. You need to recognize that your right standing, you need to receive the gift that's been waiting on your doorstep for a really long time. Evaluate. If you've received the gift, you need to remember. You see, sometimes we forget. We've been in this long enough. Sometimes you forget the gift that you were given. Sometimes you forget that you were lost and he put that gift on your doorstep even though you, you weren't looking and you opened it up and it transformed your life and you've been doing life for such a long time. You forget about how great that gift is. Don't forget, right? Here's the other thing. Whether you receive him today or have received him before, pass it on. Will you pass it on? Will you share your gift of salvation with somebody else that needs it? You see, God has a plan, and this plan doesn't change. That gift only is given through you. The people that need that gift, the people that are waiting on that gift, are waiting for you. What are you doing? How are you passing it on? Who are you praying for? Because remember this, we, we think this sometimes, that we want the perfect gift, you're gonna have your family over and everybody's gonna be there. You know the greatest gift you can give to your children? Faith. Faith. You know the greatest gift you can give to your coworkers at your Christmas party? You're always trying to find the best gift, the right thing? Jesus, an invitation to church. Something, greatest gift that you could ever give, the gift that's gonna transform things forever. So make sure that we pass it on. Will you stand so I can pray for you? 
Heavenly Father, we love you, and it's so incredible that we get to come together and we get to recognize, think through, process this wonderful gift. God, that you would bring the gift of your son for us. Lord, I pray today for anybody that's in this room. Lord, if, you, if, if, if anybody in this room isn't right, Lord, just take an opportunity now. Convict their heart. Meet them where they are. Lord, you've said that for us to get right, there's no, <laughs> there's no special thing. We just have to recognize that we need you. If you're out there, this is all you need to know. The way to get right. Confess your sins. I'm a sinner falling short of the glory of God. And I need you, Jesus. I want you. If that's you today, we'd love for you to come to the front, go to the back. We'd love to pray with you, pray for you, because you just got a gift. I want you to understand this, a gift that will change everything. Don't let it go by another day. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that because of this gift, we have a sense or an emotion, a peace and a joy that surpasses all understanding of the world. And not only are we gonna keep it for ourselves, this is so cool, we're not just keeping it for ourselves, Lord, we're gonna give and give and give. We're gonna keep taking this gift and give it to other people because we know what transformed us can transform other people. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray, amen.